Hello, this time on the banks we'll be taking a look at one of the most historical parts on the north side of Cork City, Shandon. The earliest documented evidence concerning the northern suburbs goes back to the time of St Finbar, when he was offered an invitation by the local chieftain to settle in his territory after he had arrived in the Great Marsh, now the city of Cork, from Gugon Barra. The annals then go on to tell us that the saint refused and accepted another invitation and settled on the southern hill where he built his little chapel on the site now occupied by the handsome Church of Ireland Cathedral dedicated to him. The territory Finbar was offered was a hilly woodland area, densely populated with deer and wild fowl. And it has since become the Shandon that we know today. The name Shandon is derived from the Irish name Shandun, meaning Old Fort, and this fort is reputed to have been built by the Vikings when they occupied the area a thousand years ago. As the centuries rolled by, however, Shandon became the manor for some of the great mercantile and mayoral families of Old Cork. Some gave permission to religious bodies to build churches, while others made the hilly woodland their home, such as the Barrys, by erecting themselves a castle. The serious physical and commercial growth of the parish, however, didn't really commence until after the siege of Cork in 1690, when streets, lanes and buildings began to spread westwards from the Kiln River into Sunday's Well, replacing the woodland, and so the modern-day Shandon was born. Several big industries were subsequently established in the area, such as distilleries, tanneries, butter trade and the cattle market. The most popular of these, however, was the butter trade. The butter market was established in the 1730s, and from 1769 until 1925, it was managed by a committee of merchants. Today, it is the home of the Shandon Craft Centre. In its day, the market was regarded as being the most important butter market in the British Isles. Farmers from all over County Cork and Kerry could be seen each morning wending their way up the steep hill of Shandon and the neighbouring lanes with their carts, laden with firkins of butter, hoping to get a good price. On reaching the market, the butter would be handed over for inspection, after which the excitement of bargaining between the buyers and sellers would commence. Due to the continual growth of trade, it was found necessary to enlarge the building, and this was carried out between 1850 and 1860 by Sir John Benson. During the 1880s, the exchange was handling 500,000 casks annually, valued at 1.5 million. However, by the close of the 19th century, the market was being successfully challenged by butter from France and Scandinavia. The development by the Dutch in the 1880s of butterine had a devastating effect on the cork trade, and this marked a decline in both price and sales. By the time the market closed in 1925, it had become solely a local market, thus ending an era of one of the great commercial institutions which played a major role in the economic history of Cork. The building remained closed for a number of years until the O'Gorman family took it over and converted it into a hat factory. And here they did a thriving trade until it was destroyed by fire in 1976. After this, the charcoal structure was purchased by the corporation and developed by the IDA as a craft centre, and this opened in 1984. Today the building, which has been beautifully restored, is one of the main tourist attractions in the city. The Firkin Crane Cultural Centre is probably one of the finest examples of a 19th century building in Cork. Rotund in shape, it was first erected by the Committee of Merchants around 1850 as part of the butter market. The building marks the site of one of the city's important castles, Shandon Castle. It was originally built by the Barrys and it became the centre of English administration in Munster until it was destroyed in the siege. The site was also used by the Dominicans, where they built a convent and chapel before moving to their present church on Pope's Quay in the 1840s. The term Firkin Crane has confused generations of Cork people since the building was erected. And if you're one of those who are so confused, let me enlighten you. The word firkin is Danish, 
and it means a quarter barrel. In terms of butter, that's nine gallons or 80 pounds. The butter was parked into the firkins, or casks, then it was tarred and brought to be weighed on a large balance called a crane. Hence the term, firkin crane. When the butter market closed, the firm of James Daly and Sons occupied the building until the 1970s, when the manufacture of margarine carried on by them was transferred to a new premises in Churchfield. The building then remained deserted until July 1980, when it was completely destroyed by fire. Today, the building has been magnificently restored to its former glory. One of Cork's best loved and, of course, best known buildings is St. Anne's Shandon. Perch on the Hill, this 170 foot high square structure, has been made famous throughout the world through songs, stories and ballads. Built in 1722, it replaced an older church of St. Mary's destroyed in the siege of 1690. The tower with its contrasting site of red sandstone and grey limestone dressing. The finely terraced steeple was added in 1749 and this was crowned with a gilt ball and a weather vane of a fish in the form of a salmon, 11 feet in length. Thus Corkonians christened it the Pepper Box Steeple. Canon George Salter is rector of St. Luke's and St. Anne's Shandon. Canon, how long have you been associated with Shandon? I've been 42 years uh, since I first came to Cork in 1951. But I've been rector of this parish for 50, uh, 38 years. Could you describe um, some of Shandon's uniqueness for us? Well, Shandon is unique, of course, in that the church and tower are the focal point of Cork, and not only for the people who live here, but for those who come and visit the city, it's regarded as Cork's major landmark. So much so now that we, we term it the Shandon experience. And uh, people, of course, come here to uh, view the city from the top, to view the clock, to play the bells, and to reminisce about the good old days. What about the congregation over the years? Has it changed much? Well, it's changed considerably in this way that the, now it's a non-residential congregation that we have. And the peak time, as far as this church would be concerned, would be when the army were in the barracks, the British army in the old days. Up to 1922, this church would have been packed with, the, with soldiers because this was used as an army church. What about the changes in the Shandon area itself that you've seen over the years? Well, I see huge changes because uh, changing the Firkin Crane into now a, an art centre and the idea into a centre which is a craft centre where the old butter market was. And these, of course, ha had uh, other usages in my time. They were, one was the margarine factory and the other was a hat factory. But uh, all that has changed and I think it has brought more life into the area. And also I think people have improved the dwellings and uh, more people, people are coming to live and to come back into the area again. What about the future of Shandon? Have you got any plans for it? Oh, there's a great future for this area because uh, primarily the more people who come to live in the area and the more visitors who come to live in the area, to, see, to visit the area, they will naturally spend money here and that will be good for business and it will also improve the whole setup of the area. And for Shandon itself, the actual church? The actual church itself will continue to be a place of worship as it has in the 6th century because it is, of course, a witness, a Christian witness to the world outside and particularly many who come through the doors of Shandon probably have no affinity to any Christian faith and this is, uh, continues to bear that witness all the time. which were cast in 1750 have been immortalized in the poem The Bells of Shandon, written by Father Sylvester Manny, alias Father Prout, who was born in Cork, Camden Quay, in 1804. It was in Rome in the early years of the 1830s that Father Manny wrote the poem in a period of homesickness. With deep affection and recollection, I often think of these Shandon, of bells, Shandon bells, whose sound, whose so, sound wild, so wild would in days of childhood 
circling round my cradle their magic spells. On this I ponder, where'er I wander, and thus grow fonder, sweet cock of thee, with thy bells of Shandon that sound so grand on the quiet waters of the River Lee. Father Manny died in 1866, and he is buried in the family vault here in Chandon Churchyard, under the shadow of the bells he loved so well. The tower connects four great clocks, each 14 feet in diameter. They were erected for the benefit of the citizens by the corporation in 1847. An inscription on one of the clocks reads, Passenger, measure your time for time is the measure of being. The four-faced clock is one of the largest of its kind in Europe and is the work of James Mangan. To Corkonians, the clock is known as the four-faced lyre because high winds affected the movements of the clock's hands. However, restoration work in 1987 with modern technology rectified that problem. The walk which divides the north and south churchyards of Shandon is known as the Bob and Joan Walk, and it derives its name from the two characters who stood at the gates of a charity school established here in 1716, and known as the Greencoats. The school was established to educate 20 poor boys and girls of the parish, and the uniform colours were green and yellow, hence the name Greencoats. Situated off the walk is Skiddy's home, originally built as an almshouse in 1719. It is one of the few well-preserved 18th century buildings in our city today. The Cork Preservation Society purchased and restored it to its former elegance in 1970. Mulgrave Road is the home of two widely known Cork musical and drama institutions, the Butter Exchange Band, founded in 1878, and The Loft, where Father Seamus O'Flynn established the Cork Shakespearean Society in 1924. Patcon is a long-time member of The Loft. Pat, can we go back to your earliest memory of The Loft? Oh, that goes back a good long time now. I would say back into the mid-50s. And I remember my brother was here in the loft before me, my brother Pierce. And uh, I remember coming up, I think, in 1956 to see a performance of uh, Twelfth Night uh, up here. And it was done specially for uh, a visit at the time of the, the Dublin Shakespearean Society. They were down. And I came up the stairs there, and uh, I was, of course, fascinated. And uh, I've been here ever since. Now, the history, of course, goes back a little bit further than that, doesn't it? It does indeed. It goes back to, uh, I think, about 1924. And at that time, Father of Flynn, he was the uh, curate up here at the cathedral. And uh, he decided, because he had an involvement uh, going back to his Maynooth uh, days uh, with Shakespeare, because apparently he was trained by um, the business manager of uh, Henry Irving, uh, a man by the name of Mac Hardy Flint. And uh, he did several productions of Shakespeare in Maynooth when Father Flynn was there. And of course, he was hit by the bug at the time. And then when he came back here to Cork as a young curate, uh, he decided that he would set up a Shakespearean society. And he called it the North Parish Shakespearean Society. And uh, he used a lot of young people in the choir at the time to, to start it. Uh, people like uh, Gus Healy and Tom Vesey and Eileen Corn and... The loft soon became a breeding ground for theatrical life in Cork. That's true, you see. As the, um, the, the um, popularity of the North Parish Shakespearean Society uh, began to, um, to, to flourish, he moved his premises out to a place in um, George Griffin Street and was over a shoe shop. And uh, that was really the original loft. They were there until 1926. And in 1926, they came back here to this premises over the sweet shop. And the name by that time had, uh, had uh, moved on to a rather uh, more appropriate name of the Cork Shakespearean Company. Not society, Cork Shakespearean Company. 
and he his original uh, view was that uh, he would get to the Opera House at all costs to put on productions in the Opera House. And he started to do that quite uh, early on. In fact, uh, he went into the Opera House, I think, initially in about 1927 uh, with one or two productions. And he built it up to, um, by the 1929, uh, he reached an all-time record by mounting eight, sh sh eight successive Shakespearean productions in one week. I, I remember hearing about that. A tremendous thing. And of course, by, yeah. by then, he had uh, gathered around him a very famous group, you know, people uh, comprised of um, uh, Jim Stack, um, um, uh, Joe Lynch, uh, the Golden Brothers, uh, um, Chris Corn, uh, and they formed a nucleus of actors uh, that uh, became quite famous during the 30s. Well, the loft is still thankfully with us. What about the future, Pat? Well, the future is immediate as far as we are concerned. And uh, at the moment, we are planning our winter schedule. I would imagine we will have our first production on the boards for the coming November. And then into the springtime, uh, we have a number of other productions planned as well. Um, but it will take us um, you know, a few weeks yet before we have everything together and uh, exactly what we want to do uh, on, uh, on schedule. So there is still plenty of stars in the sky up over the loft. Yes, indeed. Shiny brightly. Situated under the loft is the Exchange Toffee Works, Cork's oldest sweet factory. And the Linehan family have been manufacturing sweets here for over 60 years. Dan Linehan has been working in the family business for over 30 years. Dan, this is a family business. Can you tell me how did it all begin? Um, about 60 years ago, my father started. Mm -hmm. And uh, in here, he started, and we're here since. Now, my aunts, my sisters worked here. They are, all my family worked here. So it's a family it's tradition, a family in the best business, sense of the word. Yeah. Now, in thir you're here about 30 years. About 30 years, yeah. What sort of changes have you seen along the way? Well, on the street itself, where the Firkin Crane is at the moment, was Daly's Butter and Margarine Factory. And where the Craft Centre is at the moment, was our Barman's Hat Factory. Well, when they were there, there were a lot of people moving backwards and forwards, walking here and making the place livelier than it is at the moment. Even with the North Infirmary closed below, it's a nice hour, as you see at the moment. There were a lot of people coming and going, visitors to the hospital. And the place generally was alive, rather than today, it's not really, you know, it's... Now, you have a special tradition here with various families coming over the years for the sweets yes. on a daily basis, haven't you? Yeah, well, you know, I started all way back when. Um, the older people called for a few sweets. And down through the years, then they brought their children, their children again. So, I mean, people calling today, maybe two, three generations, looking for hard-boiled sweets, and we still supply them. What about the technology, Dan? Has it changed much over the years? No, we use the same ingredients. The process is much the same, other than we did use cork fires, now we're on gas. That's the only change. Recipes. The ingredients and the process are still the same. What about the pots and pans and everything? <laughs> Utensils? Well, what you really do is only... They're all, they're all the copper pots, they're only replaced ever so often, but they really last a long time. Any secrets you can tell me about the process? Mm. There are secrets, but you don't, you don't really talk about those. No upset. <laughs> <laughs>
One of Cork's best loved hospitals was the North Infirmary. It was originally built in the year 1719 and housed 24 patients. It was 70 feet long and 24 feet wide. But due to the growth of the northern suburbs and the expansion of the city's population, it was soon extended. In the 1980s, the government embarked on a series of health cuts. And it was due to one of these that the hospital was closed in 1987. Looking back on its colourful history, it is very sad to see that it is now virtually a public eyesore. of Shandon is the Cork Civic Trust. The trust was established in 1990 to heighten people's awareness of buildings and their heritage environment. It also helps to conserve and restore fine pieces of past periods. Their home is here behind me at 50 Pope's Quay and it was one of their first projects. The building is one of the oldest in the city and dates back to the early years of the 18th century when the quay was called North Quay where vessels moored. It was once the home of the merchant family, the Maltbys, descendants of whom now live in London. The first evidence of Chandon Street goes back as far as 1641, when it was known as Mallow Lane, being the main road to Mallow. But in fact, it goes back a lot further than that, to the time of the Vikings, when it was situated in a forest of fine trees. And Chandon Street at that time was a narrow, dusty roadway. The present streetscape didn't appear until the last century. Before this, it was dressed on both sides with mud cabins, roofed with thatch. Leading off Shandon Street is Blarney Street, which was originally called Blarney Lane, and it was formerly the main western entrance to the city. It was here that Frank O'Connor lived with his parents for a time before moving to Harrington Square and no doubt much of his inspiration that was to make him one of Ireland's best-loved literary sons came from what he saw and heard on this busy, highly populated street. Well, we've come to the end of our visit to Shandon, and life has certainly changed over the centuries. Families have come and gone, businesses have come and gone, and industries have come and gone. But one thing certainly looks set to stay forever. The Bells of Shandon.